It's good to see everyone this morning, uh, and I invite you to go ahead and turn to your, uh, in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Uh, that's where we were last Sunday night, and I pulled out of the second half of the chapter for the sermon this morning, uh, for the time I have with you. Uh, as you're turning there, I just wanted to um, remind everyone that this weekend is our Young People's Weekend Study, uh, something we've been doing for the past four years now, and almost every year... Uh, we usually get a study out of it. Somebody walks in from off the street, just heard about it from somebody else, and they come and we get a study. And a few of those had led to conversions. Uh, the first time we ever did not get a study out of one of these studies was actually last year. Uh, we, nothing really happened after that. I'm sure some good happened, but at least I didn't see it. Uh, so I've been trying real hard to push this one. Uh, we're trying something different. Instead of having multiple speakers, Jeff May is going to come, and he's just going to teach it all. Uh, and here's his course, uh, or his lesson plans for this weekend. Uh, if you see, there's a theme about idolatry. Um, and especially maybe some of us that have been in the Jeremiah class, uh, we would appreciate a sermon or a series of lessons about idolatry in the modern world. Uh, and so Friday, he's going to do a lesson, Idols, Are They in Your Heart and Your Life? And we'll have a 30-minute singing after that. That starts at 7 o'clock on Friday. And then Saturday morning at 9, he'll do a God or, God, your, or God's, you choose the gods of food and entertainment, the gods of sex, money, and family. Uh, and of course, these lessons are geared towards uh, people that are in their teenager years and people in their 20s, uh, but everyone's welcome to come and be a part of this. And I know Jeff holds a special place in a lot of your hearts, and so come and hear him speak. I think he's going to have a really good, powerful lesson from God's Word, and I'm really excited about that. So that's going to start this Friday at 7. And Saturday morning at 9, and we'll be done about at about 12 o'clock. So you'll be able to go home and eat lunch and, and have the rest of your Saturday. So excited about that. And if you do me a favor, go pick up one of those flyers. Uh, I feel bad. I feel like I printed off too many because there's still so many out there. And what's funny about it is like after, well, I thought I brought one up here. I don't know where it is. Oh, there it is. There's one of them. I printed so many of these off, and there's still a lot back there. Go pick one up and, and, and you know, post it on a bulletin board at work or at school. Give it to your buddy. When you go out to eat for lunch, leave your tip, leave a tip, and this for your waiter. You, know, you can get rid of these somehow, right? So go get rid of these because these are useless on Friday. We can't invite people to this after Friday. It won't be happening anymore, right? So go, go grab one of these and, and give them to someone. Uh, and let's try to get some people to come to this study that may... I've never really even heard about God before. And so be excited about that, and let's get motivated about the weekend study that we have this weekend. Uh, what I'd like to spend time with you talking about this morning is this great line out of Titus chapter 2. Uh, and we're going to be talking about living soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. What's the present age? The present age is right now, right? It's the present. Read this with me. Titus 2, let's start in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before we get into this verse, let's first talk about what the word age means, at least the way that it's used in this context. Uh, the way that we use the word age, age or ages is described just simply a time period. Uh, maybe some of us are familiar with the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. And all that the reason that exists for is just basically to kind of come up with a timeline in our mind or time periods in our mind back in a day when people really didn't rely on the calendar of years, right? And so simply the way that the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age works is that if you dig up a, an old city that's been abandoned, and most of the tools there that you find within that city that those people used to use are made out of stone, then we would call that the Stone Age. Okay, this is the time period when people were mostly using stone tools. You dig up a city and you find that most of the tools are bronze. Well, then the people call that, well, that's the Bronze Age. That was a time period uh, between this time and this time when people mostly used bronze tools. And you would understand the same for the Iron Age, right? Well, when the Bible uses the word age, it doesn't use the contents of our tools to describe the age. It usually is using covenants. Well, this is the age of the Old Covenant. This is the age of the covenant between the creation and the flood. This is the age of Jesus in the New Covenant. Or maybe it uses big t moments in human history. 
Uh, between creation and flood can be considered an age. Between the flood and Moses can be considered an age. Between Moses and Jesus can be considered an age. And now we live under an age between the cross and the final coming of Jesus Christ. And that now is the present age. And so when Paul here says the grace of God through salvation teaches us to deny worldly lust and to live righteously and soberly and godly in the present age, Paul's talking about right now. He's talking about it being 65 A.D., maybe when he wrote this book. And he's also talking about 2019. That's the present age. We'll read this passage. I think all of us will say amen. And we agree with it. And at least here while we're in this room, we agree with it. But I think probably the way a lot of us are living our lives at home and away from the building, we actually don't believe this passage. And what I say by that is that just too many times I've even seen in my own life when I wasn't pursuing God the way I needed to be, I didn't believe Paul was right here. I didn't believe Paul was saying something that was actually possible. That you could live such in a manner that you would deny the world and that you would live soberly, righteously, and godly right now in today's world. You could do that. Because what we do, and what I've done before, is we get so caught up in our desires, we get so caught up in being part of the world, the desires that the, the world brings, that we start making excuses. We tell ourselves it's impossible to live righteously in today's age. There's too many temptations, Lord. Lord, the cards are stacked against me. There's no way that I can live righteously in the world today. And we tell ourselves that excuse over and over again, so basically, we can do what we want. Another excuse I hear sometimes is you deal with young people thinking about the weekend study. And just like so many of us when we were young, young people, sometimes we get caught up in the world just like older people do. And you have see something, maybe one day I see one of my sisters in Christ post something on Snapchat that she doesn't need to be posting. Or she reveals that she's in a place or with people that she doesn't need to be around. And I go and I approach that sister and I say, you know, did you post this? You know, why are you holding this cup with these contents in it? Why are you with these people? Why are you dressed this way? Why are you at this event? And they blow you off and they just say, this is just what we do now, Andrew. This is the way things are now. And when that doesn't work, you know, maybe because she still un lives under her parents' roof, you go to the parents and you say, you know, mom and dad, did you know that your child's posting this on Snapchat? And sometimes they handle it great. Sometimes they go, well, Andrew, that's just today's age, isn't it? That's just what people do today. This is just what 2019 is. It's impossible to raise godly children in 2019. And yet Paul said that we can live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age. A story my dad tells a lot is that when me and Sarah were little, uh, he had the preacher over for a gospel meeting. Uh, and him and his wife came over to the house, and they were eating dinner. And mom and dad, recently having Sarah and having had me for just a year, were excited about the children that they had, and they were talking to each other about it. And the preacher's wife <laughs> looked at my dad and said, Well, I just don't know how it's possible to raise godly children in today's age. And dad's response was like, Well, I guess we'll just go throw the children out in the backyard since it's pointless. I'm not going to tell you if you come and ask me who that preacher's wife was. I think she was just having a weak moment at the, at the time. But I think that was happening back in the 90s. <laughs> and people are still saying the same thing today. And yet Paul said that we can live soberly, righteously, and godly right now. No matter what day it is. You see, if we look at this just from a logical standpoint, if you look at the passage, verse 12 if we say verse 12 isn't true and it's not possible, then we also have to say that verse 11 isn't true or possible. Because you see at the beginning of verse 12 teaching us that 12 is dependent on verse 11. And what does verse 11 say? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So if we're going to say verse 12 is not true, we also got to say verse 11 is not true. That God has not provided this generation with grace or salvation, and we're all condemned anyhow. So I just want to see as you read Titus 2, this is either you're all in or you're all out situation. 
If you believe it's true, then great for you. You are, have also been offered grace and salvation. If you believe that verse 12 is not possible in today's age, well, then you might as well lose verse 11 too. You're, you're dead in your sin, and there's no way you can get out. So if you decided that you're all in, and you believe that verse 12 is true, well, then I have a sermon for you. If you don't, I, you have to work on that first. Let's talk about this. And then first we'll talk about the age. And then secondly, we'll talk about the second half of that passage, verse 13, and, and the sermon will be yours. Uh, do we live in an evil age today? Uh, the answer is actually very easy. Yes, we do, right? Don't turn there yet if you bear with me. We're going to read it later. But Galatians 1.4, Paul actually says this present evil age. He calls the age we're living in is very evil. And why would you think that? Well, it's easy. You read the news. And Paul was reading the news too, right? Look, turn to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, this is the reason why we live in an evil age. In chapter 4, Paul actually talking about the reason why he preaches and the reason why he continues to press forward even though the world is fighting against him. He says here in verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we renounce the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. So if you want to give a quick answer, why is this age evil? Was well, because of the God of this age has blinded them, right? And I just think that this passage is talking about Satan. That Satan has developed such a world where people are afraid of God's word. They don't want to look at God's word. They don't want to have to think about God's word because they think God's word is going to do something to them if it shines upon them. And it is going to do something to them, but they think it's something negative. They don't want to have to deal with that. And so they get further and further and further debt in their sin to the point that they don't even think there's a way out anymore. And Satan's responsible for that. Satan's also responsible for the news that we hear, right? And let me give you some of my favorites. Sometimes uh, me and Emily send these to each other uh, because we actually think sometimes they're very funny. One of them recently that happened in 2017, that in Phoenix, Arizona, a woman that identified as a man became in a relationship with another man and now is pregnant with his baby. It was newsworthy because this, they said this is the first person in the world to give birth while living as both a man and a woman. It's funny because you have a woman that identifies with, as a man living with another man and they're pregnant and they think it's a miracle. But actually, what is that? That's a normal heterosexual relationship with extra steps. And that's newsworthy, right? And, and we're fed these things, and we see these things, and we click them on Facebook. And they make money, right? And we get all worked up, and we get all upset. What about this one? This was my personal favorite. The United Church of Canada has decided to retain Greta Vosper as a minister in the UCC, despite the fact that she's an atheist. So their preacher is an atheist. Two years earlier, the UCC had declared that Vosper was unfit for ministry because she could not affirm her vows or the UCC confession. Yet now, in a joint statement between the church and Vosper's church, we learn that the Toronto conference that Reverend Greta Vosper and West Hill United Church have settled all outstanding issues between them, yet Vosper still denies God's existence. So we have a church here, and their preacher doesn't believe in God, but they couldn't fire her because of a lawsuit. And that's newsworthy, right? And we look at it and we go, we live in an evil age. I was reading last week that local magnet schools in Korea began mandatory assemblies on Sunday morning. And Christian parents speculate that the new school assembly exists solely for the purpose to keep their kids out of church services in Korea. What about this one? Being that there's a Protestant wave caught in England, very people are upset about the Christian movement there. So religious fanatic Robert Catsby was caught trying to plant a bomb in the House of Lords. Or what about this newsworthy moment? 
The local church at Corinth has a man there that has now has a relationship with his stepmother. The church of Corinth has not mourned, but instead celebrated their open-mindedness to new practices and beliefs, saying love is love, and no one can deny them that. Obviously, with that last one, you can already get the point of why I'm reading all these news clips. Because that last one, even though it sounds just like 2019, when did it happen? It happened in the first century. Then a man took his father's wife, and the church celebrated it instead of mourned over. The last one I just read about Robert Catsby that was trying to start the Christian movement in England and, and setting a bomb in the House of Lords, when was that? It sounds like 2019, a bomb threat, right? No, it happened in 1605. That was the gunpowder plot. The one about Korea where schools were mandatory, having these mandatory assemblies just so Christian children could not go to church that day. That was happening in 1930 under Japanese-occupied Korea. Now the last two were happening last year. What's my point in all this? It's always been evil, guys. Nothing has changed. It has always been just as evil as it always has been. From us to Jesus. And you see that even though those things were all evil, Christians still endured. And they still lived righteously and soberly and godly in their present age. Just really quickly here, who else lived in an evil age? How about this man? Did Noah live in an evil age? It was so bad, God decided to destroy the whole earth. And yet for some way, he was able to raise his family to live righteously and soberly and godly in his present age. What about Abraham? Abraham saw two cities that God sent fire on because of their wickedness and evil. And Abraham actually tried to speak to God on their behalf and save them and be an intercessor. And yet Abraham was able to live soberly and righteously and godly in his present age. Samuel, dealing with unfaithful Israel that wanted a king, turned their back to God, made sacrifices whenever they wanted to. And yet somehow Samuel lived soberly and righteously and godly in his present age. What about Jeremiah? In a time when basically you read his whole book, you only meet really like five people that actually care about God. And yet Jeremiah lived soberly and righteously and godly in his present age. What about Jesus' disciples? This is the generation that actually killed the Messiah. And what did Jesus' disciples do? They lived soberly and righteously and godly in the present age. And what about Paul? He actually called his age evil. And yet he lived soberly and righteously and godly in the present age. You're tired of me saying it now. All of God's people have lived in evil ages. And yet they still were able to achieve what Paul calls us to do in Titus chapter 2. So now what's our excuse? I think it's evident we don't have an excuse. The age has always been evil. We can't blame the world around us because of our sin. The only person we can blame is ourselves. Because all these people were managed to do it. Well then how did these people do stay faithful? Well now let's turn to Galatians chapter 1. I told you not to turn there, but now we're going to read it. In Galatians 1, verse 3, he tells us why these people were able to stay faithful and why we can stay faithful too. In his introduction to Galatians, verse 3, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, when we're dealing with these struggles, and we're so focused on how bad the world is, and how temptation is so great, and how we have so many new avenues for sin, and it's so awful, we fail to think about and to realize the power and the might of Jesus Christ. Because he says here that this is a present evil age, but Jesus Christ has delivered us from it through the power of his blood, through the power of his death. And so when we start making those excuses, instead of focusing on the power of the world, why don't we instead put the focus on the power of Jesus Christ's power to deliver, which he has promised us that he can do. He can create an environment that's all about him. It may not extend among our own bodies. But he can create an environment for us that's all about him. And even more with maybe more application, let's turn to Ephesians 6. 
another time the word age was used. We're reading uh, seven total passages this morning, uh, and every single one of them speaks and, or uses the word age to describe what's going on. Ephesians 6, 11. Paul encourages here, he says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You know, you imagine here for just a second if he didn't write verse 13 or the beginning of verse 11. Wouldn't it sound completely awful? I mean, wouldn't it sound like we were completely hopeless? No, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we have these principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness that are after our souls and trying to destroy us. And at the first it is there, it would be awful, wouldn't it? And yet that's not what he says. He ends it with this, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you can withstand, and having done all to stand. And he goes on to describe the different parts of the armor of God. So instead of making excuses for our sin, how about we do this instead? How about we put on the whole armor of God? Why don't we just use the tools that God has given us to accomplish Titus chapter 2? Now, again, the problem lies in is that you have people, and I think sometimes myself included, that are living in sin and make excuses and then at the same time refuse to put on the armor of God. And so they basically they're just in this vicious cycle of sin. They're, they're not getting out. Well, no, we have to put on the armor. And then once we put on the armor, now let's start thinking about maybe if we actually have excuses or not. When you're dealing with, you know, just complete struggles and sin and you feel like you're failing and you never come to Bible class, you never come to worship on Sunday night or Wednesday night, you never come to any of the other Bible studies that me and Jason are trying to put together, you never try to make Bible studies in your own time when you have the opportunity to talk to people, uh, you don't come to Devin's Tuesday morning little prayer meeting when we get at the Civic Center and we pray together. You don't take any of those opportunities that God's given you, and then you come up and you start making excuses? You know, what's God's reaction going to be to that? It's like he's set out all this armor for us. He's polished it for us. It's perfect. It's exactly what it needs to be. You're all going to be protected, and, and you leave your house without the armor, and then you come back to God and you're complaining that you got cut. What's God going to be like? Actually, our God is so loving and forgiving, he's probably going to tell you he's sorry. But what would we say? We would go, well, you didn't put your armor on. So what I would encourage us to do this morning is to put our armor on. Use the avenues that God's given you to be in right with him. Look at these tools that God has given us to be right with him. If you're still in Titus 2, one of them is verse 13. If you look back there in Titus chapter 2, there at the end of this passage in verse 13. He says, we're going to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. So there's a concept here that as we go out into the world and we fight these daily battles we're fighting, we're always going to be mindful of the hope that Jesus has laid out before us. That he's going to return and he's going to set everything right, even though we're living in this evil age. We have to fight this battle like the war has already been won. And I think corely here, you think about the suffering of the first century Christians. This is what the book of Revelation is about. That you have to fight the battle like the war has already been won. You think about Joshua and his generation that entered into the promised land. They had that mindset that even though they were going to go into the promised land, and they were going to have to fight all these little battles. They believed that they had already won. And when you believe that you've already won the battle, you win every time. Because of that confidence and that blessed assurance that we sing about that sometimes we don't actually have. The confidence that Jesus has already won the war. For instance, turn to Ephesians 1.20. Two passages I want to read that, that show us some of the tools that God has given us to have this blessed assurance, this confidence. Ephesians 1.20. Starting halfway through a thought here. Talking about God, which he worked in Christ 
when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. And I believe that second age he's talking about is talking about heaven. 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Even though we read this passage, and like I said in Titus chapter 2, we read it and we believe it when we read it, but through our actions, I think maybe many of us actually don't believe it. And I think the main action that shows that we actually don't believe that Jesus has been given all power and principalities on this earth and in heaven is the action of anxiety, which maybe is like the number one thing that Christians deal with. I mean, I can't take a survey, but I just imagine that's probably one of the number one things. Constant anxiety about the world around us. Constant anxiety because of the news that we watch. Constant anxiety because when our kids come home and tell us what they learned at school. Constant anxiety because what your boss said to you the other day. Constant anxiety. Why do we have constant anxiety? Because sometimes we are not believing that Jesus Christ is actually head of all principality and power. We forget that our leader is actually in charge. And I understand why we think about that sometimes. I mean, you think about when Nero came and he started just taking Christians and crucifying them all through the street and saying these people were responsible for the fire here in Rome. Don't you think Christians would be asking the question, you know, well, okay, does the Lord still have all principality and power? And yet the Lord did. And you read a lot of historians that talk about that event. They say that actually that Nero targeting the Christians was the best thing that ever happened for Christianity. At that moment, people would start, common people started looking at that and saying, this is ridiculous. we got to stop blaming the Christians for everything. Nero is here telling me that my brother here, Billy, is the reason for the fire in Rome and all these problems in today's age. But man, Billy's a good person. And he invites me to that church all the time. I mean, I don't really like that. But, you know, he tells me happy birthday on my birthday. And last week I was sick and he brought me food. And all the people start going, you know, actually I don't think these Christians are bad people. And so Jesus actually used that event to work for good so that he could preserve his people in a huge way. Let's never forget that Jesus is still in charge. What about this? That Jesus is in charge but the evil rulers that depose him are coming to an end. Look at this sixth passage here. 1 Corinthians 2. Number six out of seven. Bear with me here. Paul talking about the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. Verse five, he says, Your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory. Don't put your faith in the rulers of this age because they're all coming to nothing. Has not every ruler of this age come to nothing except for Jesus Christ? You know, what's the benefit of being mortal is our kings and our rulers, they're mortal too. And for a lot of us, you know, sometimes the solution is we just can outlive them. They're going to come to nothing. All the attempts that have been made against good and in righteousness, you know, what has come to those things? They've come to nothing. You think about the example I gave in the 1930s. Japan comes in, Japan comes into Korea and says, look, uh, you know, we're going to take your skids, we're going to school them, they're going to come and they're going to attend on Sunday because we're going to keep them out of those Christian churches. What happened to the Japanese empire? It came to nothing. They're not practicing that anymore. And all you needed was Christians that would patiently endure these trials to wait for Jesus to work in his own good time. And we see those events happening for the past 2,000 years and more than that into the Old Testament. And what do we still do? We're still anxious that the rulers actually aren't going to come to nothing. Using this passage again, our faith is not in the wisdom of this age. It's in the power of God. You know, we don't rely on man-made wisdom. Man-made wisdom changes every 20 years. And there's a new thing, and there's a new process, and there's a new thought. God's wisdom has, still has not changed, and yes, endured the test of time. 
We don't put our faith in something that's temporary like the wisdom of this age. We put our faith in the one that is ageless, the ancient of days, right? Let's look at our seventh passage, Matthew 28. When I started the sermon with the word age, I, I assume a lot of you thought that we would end here. Matthew 28, looking at verse 19. Jesus speaking to his disciples, giving them their mission since he's about to leave the earth. Verse 19 of chapter 28, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's neat about this is that he obviously is talking to the inner, tw- you know, the inner disciples, right? The inner eleven. And so we could easily go, okay, well, this is just a promise given to the eleven. But because of the phrase that he uses at the end about the age, makes me believe this is a promise made to you and me too. Because he tells the disciples, I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, did the disciples live all the way to the end of the age? No, they were there for about 40 or more, maybe 50 more years, and then they were gone. And they returned to him in paradise, right? But by saying that he said to the end of the age, I think Jesus here is looking into the future. He's saying, I'm going to be with you, my disciples, until the very end of the age. I'm not going anywhere. And I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to be supporting you. And then he gives them a job, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus is trying to encourage his disciples, he says, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. And what else does he do? He gives them a job. Right? Here's the confidence, and here's the job. I used to work at, at a YMCA day camp. And, and it's funny, that, you know, my job before a preacher, I worked at like a day camp. And so my only like life experience with real work, real work, oh no, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> my only experience with non preacher work is with that day camp. And I, I still think about that day camp that I ran in high school and in college. I remember you'd have a kid come in that was brand new, and he was full of anxiety. He was worried he was leaving his mama for the very first time. And we always had two things that we did to him. We came and we talked to him, and we gave him confidence. We told him, hey, look, mama's going to come back at the end of the day. We're going to have a lot of fun today. And the second thing you did was, guess what? You gave him a job. You gave him something to do. So they're not sitting in their corner thinking about their mama for the rest of the day. Hey, can you beat me in checkers? I don't think you can. You get him playing checkers, and now we're okay. All right? We can deal with it. What does Jesus do when he leaves the disciples? One, he gives them confidence, and then number two, he gives them a job. Think about it back to Titus chapter 2. Here, a passage about confidence, and yet look how Paul ends in verse 14. We haven't read this verse yet. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Jesus here in Titus 2, he says, you know, live in the present, godly, soberly, and righteously. There's a job. Let me give you confidence, looking to the hope that I'm going to come back one day. And then he ends with this. Hey, my people, they're my own special people, and they've got a job. They're zealous for good works. So let me just encourage you as we go into the rest of the week, to find your job. Find your job and, and take these three things home. Number one, every age has been evil. Number two, Jesus has always preserved his people in every evil age. And number three, Jesus has given us a job to do. And if we can think about those three things, I think it would make us better workers in his kingdom. People that aren't filled and flooded by the God of this age of our anxieties and fear but at people that have blessed assurance and confidence in Jesus Christ, which those are the Christians that we've been called to meet. If there's anyone here uh, this morning that needs to put on Christ in baptism, uh, obviously we've talked about that a little bit in Matthew 28, but especially if there's anyone here that needs to, to be with Christ again and needs to do those three things, needs to stop putting their worries in this evil age, needs to remind that Jesus has all power and authority and needs to go find their job again, why don't you please come forward and receive the prayers of the congregation if you'll come forward as we stand and sing.